हाँ so are they here I know I'm trying to get myself going here and get this shared. You got me thrown off here. All right, bye. Okay. So Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to work this out here. Um, Raphael, if PowerPoint is hard, we can talk. We don't need PowerPoint. We're fine. You're sitting in the gallery. We're absolutely comfortable without it. I think you're right. And right now, this is getting a little bit, a little bit problem here. Okay. Uh, does everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry for this. Um, we're having some problems with the PowerPoint presentation and getting the Zoom, the Zoom presentation going. Um, hello, my name is Rafa Damas, and welcome to Taya Patrikenio again um, to an exhibition to to seeing here seeing hearing uh, conversation. Um, that I want to focus, that focus on race and representation. Uh, this 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 conversation came up came about from the exhibition Darkest Tangs currently having at Taller Puerto Rico, Los Los Pasanos del Puerto, Portraits of the Chinese Diaspora, and uh, uh, Diaspora Community in Punta Arenas, Los Costa Rica. That's now on view through March 29th. Um, we wanted to build on a conversation. You know, on the topics that she that she started in in, in, her, in the themes of the presentation, and excuse me. which Los Pisanas, um started, and principally the ex and this is something that came about which, when I was starting to write about the exhibition, and that's going to be thinking about um, three ways of seeing. While well, presenting Los Pesanos de Puerto, Puerto de Chinese Diaspora in Puterenas, Costa Rica, she she did a talk at Tilt where she talked about three ways, three ways of seeing. Ten referred to how institution sees us, how our peers might see us, how we see ourselves. She pointed out about the tensions in this tri triangulation, which alludes to something intrinsic to our nature that impacts how we see ourselves and our community. Furthermore, it determines how we engage with each other and test our sense of belonging and understanding of race, nationality, and entitlement. Um, I want to talk a little bit, before we talk, I just want to describe who I am, and we're all going to be talking a little bit about this coming. My name is Rafael Damas. I am, my pronouns are he, him. And I was born in Venezuela. I see myself as a Venezuelan um, who grew up here in the United States. I also 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 can think about my my father's heritage of being Uruguay, so I um, so I also think about his Uruguayan heritage, and and growing up in New York and coming and immigrating to the United States, uh, my immigration experiences is also something that really defines me. Going through the visa process, um, trying to reconcile my identity when I visit my own country and reconciling my identity when I became an American citizen. And thinking about what is an American, um, I feel that we're going. I'm going to give talk. Well, this this talk is going to we're going to invite different different participants to explain themselves, talk about who they are, um, their intentionality, and hopefully we can just talk a little bit more about that. Some of the some of the questions that are that, that arose in the exhibition. Sadly, I wish we could have shown some of the images in the, at, uh, at that's at the gallery, but hopefully you can come 
see them and also can visit some of the institutions, some of the people here. Okay. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to um, introduce Dorcas Tang, um, who is currently, who shows currently here at the Yapurta Kenya. Thank you. Yes. Shall I introduce myself? Yes, please okay. introduce yourself. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so my name is Dorcas Tang. Um, I'm currently calling in from unceded Gadigal land. Um, which is also so-called Sydney, Australia, and want to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and that sovereignty here was never ceded. Um, so I just wanted to give a quick visual description of myself um, for um, those who um, need it. Uh, I am an Asian femme presenting person with gold rim glasses, red lipstick, and a sort of crazy mullet with a blonde front and a dark back. <laughs> um, and I use she, they pronouns. Um, and as Raphael said, um, I am the, I guess, person whose name is on the title of this exhibition at Tiger currently. Um, and we, I think we decided to kind of all maybe um, sort of introduce ourselves with a, with a little bit about our um, relationships with our cultural identity. Cause I think the um, panel, um, we are touching on a lot of, kind of topics of race and representation. So a little bit about my own relationship to Asianness or specifically um, being part of the Chinese diaspora. Um, my great grandparents fled Southern China for Malaysia in the early 20th century. Um, and my family has been there since. Um, but then when I was four, I moved to China, uh, mainland China. Um, so I often speak about this sort of disconnect between the cultures that I'm a part of um, and that I'm never seen as authentically Chinese in China. Um, and But my cousins would call me China girl growing up in, uh, when I went back to Malaysia. Um, and I suppose um, very much comes out also my relationship to Asianness, I think a lot in the context of being kind of a settler in the countries that I inhabit, for example, so-called Australia, um, Lenape land in America, um, as in we're always seen as outsiders, right, and non-belonging, but we're also um, certainly um, settlers on unceded lands as well. Um, and then also kind of thinking about being Asian and the dynamics of dating in these um, white spaces, which is a whole nother project I've worked on. Um, yeah, that's me. I guess that was maybe a bit long, um, but passing it on to the um, next person. <laughs> I, I might just jump in and introduce myself then. Um, I'm Ann Ishii. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of Asian Arts Initiative and also a writer, musician, artist. Um, really pleased to be here sharing a space with my colleagues and Dorcas. And um, I am, uh, it's funny, as soon as I start wanting to describe myself visually, I realize hair is like an actually interesting, contentious part of my identity. Um, I too have kind of very unnatural blonde hair right now for an East Asian woman and um and I love it I just love dyeing my hair it's just something I really enjoy doing having had done to me um I'm wearing glasses and some gold jewelry and I have kind of a classic chin length bob <laughs> I could talk about my hair all day but I'll stop so um I identify as Asian American because my parents have such um complex backgrounds and my connection to them and our ancestors is also somewhat tenuous, but I, I believe very, very, very deeply in the importance of kind of recognizing the through line from past now to the future. I have a child, so I really understand the value of keeping ancestral connections alive. Uh, but my mother is Korean, ethnically Korean, and then her family refugiated to Japan my father is Japanese, but refugiated to Hawaii uh, as his family were part of a sort of a weird Buddhist sect. Um, and so there's sort of strange. And um, so I like Asian American as a political identity. Uh, it kind of speaks to the times I grew up in. 
was born in the 70s, raised in LA, um, and in Asian American identity studies, ethnic studies was huge in California and a very present part of my cultural understanding of personal identity. Um, I'm going to pass it to Aisha. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Dorcas, and thank you, Raphael. Again, uh, my gratitude for being here with all of you. Um, I will introduce myself. I'm Aisha Khan, um, and uh, I my pronouns are she and her. I am a founder and director of Twelve Gates Arts. Um, it's an organization um, in Philadelphia. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about 12 Gates as 12 Gates is an established platform and home base for um, emerging South Asian and West Asian American artists, curators and audiences. Uh, when these artists present work in traditional Eurocentric art spaces, their craft is often condensed through the Occidental perception and of Oriental art or any kind of uh, regional art and imposing therein a struggle against for centuries. Um, but at 12 Gates, diasporic artists can exhibit in full um, dimensionality, the contradictions and limitations of their practice. Um, organization is 14 year old. Uh, for me, I would uh, say I am 5'1 and uh, dark brown hair. Um, I'm feeling a little left out with my hair color and boring hair. So, <laughs> and uh, I am, I, um, and of course I'm from Pakistan. Uh, I grew up in, um, I was born in Pakistan, which is a country in the Asian continent and within Asia, it is a subcontinent of South Asia. Um, so yes, I'm South Asian uh, by heritage. So I, this year, actually, 2023, I lived in US, uh, USA for 22 years, and I lived in Pakistan for 22 years. So when I marked that when last year, when it was 22 years, I thought about it a lot. Um, for me, I never had difficulty explaining what is home for me. For me, Philadelphia is home. And for me, Pakistan is home and Pakistan and Philadelphia is the only place where I lived longer anywhere in my in, as a city. And as Anne said, I'm also a mother and raising a teenager in um, this country. So for me, identity, for me, heritage, for me, culture, for me, narrative is very important. Um, and I believe in this, that um, our like our kids, our younger generation, um, we pave some kind of path for them where um, there is that pride in art and history in literature there's always there's a lot of pride always but then more and more institutions we needed um, so that's um, where i think my relationship to my institution to my asianness well um, thank you i think this um i feel like I've, i did not describe myself but um yeah and uh and well, I'm about 5'11", not too tall. I have short hair. I'm graying and thinning. Um, I'm, I'm kind of cream color, but I sometimes I tan and get really dark. And and I'm starting, yeah, and uh, and, and and I'm starting, and, uh, and I guess I'm like people would describe me having a dad, a kind of dad bob, bob. So like you know, so it's my aging, and and of a and I'm also a father of a and of an amazing seven-year-old. Um, so, um, by the way, I'm trying to inform you, five eleven is actually tall. <laughs> is it okay? All yeah, right. you're talking to three Asians. It's it's tall. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, well, okay. Then um, I'm unexpectedly tall. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but uh, thank you for and um, and about Tayyip Puerto Rican year. We they're celebrating our fiftieth anniversary where we've been focusing on predominantly Puerto Rican and Latin American artists. And I think if anyone's been wondering about why we are, um, we're, we're, we're looking at Asian diaspora in this conversation, why Dorcas Tang is here. I think this is, an, um, I think this is the right conversation to join because I feel there's a long history of connections between Asia and, and South America and Latin America. And there's a lot of questions to think about what it is to be a citizen in, of the Americas, especially after colonization. Um, 
So I, I, I do want to say that I think I managed to get the the presentations up. So maybe we can get that up, and then um, and then maybe if I'm, and I would and I would, and, and hopefully we can get Dorcas to maybe give us a presentation about her work before we can lead into Aisha and talking about, I know that she has some some work which she would like to show us, which I think which which dovetails well with um with this conversation and gives and gives some further insights. All right, so just bear with me. Okay. So are you seeing it? Slideshow? Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. So um just hang. All right. So um so yes. if I'm, uh, if uh Dirkus could just uh, let just tell us can tell me where to go and I'll just mute uh, myself. Yeah. Um, so the first slide, I guess I just wanted to contextualize. Los Paisanos de Puerto obviously is about the Chinese diaspora in a town called Punta Arenas, Costa Rica. Um, maybe let's just pause at the first two images um, and I'll let, I'll just let you know when to click, Rafael. Um, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, so Punta Arenas is a quite a small town. It's a port town, and it was the site where it was a town where the first Chinese indentured laborers first arrived in 1855. Um, and it's quite a sleepy town. There's not much really any reason you'd go nowadays. Um, but you know, back in the day, it was a thriving port town. Um, and I personally was sort of interested in it because I studied abroad in Costa Rica, and um, you know, studied sort of. Um, was in uh, Spanish, studying Spanish at the time, and also studying education. And um, it kind of converged into this interest of like being in Costa Rica, seeing, meeting up with a Chinese Costa Rican person and being quite surprised as to that, as to the fact that there was, you know, a, a Chinese presence in Costa Rica in general. Um, and we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is me in the town when I first arrived in 2018, I met, a, uh, there was a woman named Flora who I'd kind of um, gotten in contact with over through academic connections predominantly because at the time I was studying at Swarthmore College. Um, and actually that's how this exhibition at Tiger happened because I put up an exhibition at Swarthmore and really wanted to sort of engage with the um, Latinx community and reach out to Raphael. Um, and lo and behold, four years later, five years later, we're, um, there's an exhibition there. <laughs> um, so this photo is me and Flora, the woman who um, was so gracious in hosting me, um, you know, and also introducing me to her network, her community. Um, and, um, you know, like it was quite um, interesting the way that she decided to host me because initially I think in... Um, academic Susan Chen, she reached out to Flora being like, oh, would you be willing to host this um, young person who's, you know, from overseas, from the U.S.? And she initially said no, because, um, oh, well, anyway, so it turned out that she um, learned that I was Chinese and then said yes. So I think um, thinking about the ways that my um, race kind of plays into the um project and I guess the identities that have allowed me to um, connect with this community. Um, and can, we can go to the next slide. Um, so in the exhibition itself, I've grouped um, the images that I've taken into three different ways of seeing, I suppose. So firstly, in the portraits that I've taken of um, people who form part of the community there between 2018 and 2019, um, as well as their own um, images that they have in their family albums that I was very privileged and lucky to be able to see, um, as well as a third um, sort of big document called El Registro de Chinos, which was a, I would argue, sort of a um, document that was based in surveillance and control by the Costa Rican government because it only registered Chinese people um, um, that documented them in every town they were at to ensure that you, basically you had to be registered in the um, document to be able to come back, right? Because we think about citizenship as the right of return. Um, and so only Co Costa Rican Chinese people needed to be in the document. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, and so this is a view of the exhibition itself. As I, I was mentioning earlier that I, the last time I was at Tyre was in 2019 before 
um, COVID and everything. So it was an interesting experience to put up an exhibition in a space that I had not physically been in for four years, uh, which is an interesting challenge in itself. Um, we can go to the next slide. But the way that it's set up is sort of in these um, thematic groupings. For example, one of them is um, Catholicism. I There was some imagery that, um, you know, a lot of the Chinese Costa Ricans that I talked to were very Catholic um, because of the sort of lack of separation between church and state in the public school system. So a lot of um, folks were quite religious. Um, so, or there's a, another grouping in the show that kind of touches on themes of food or sports. It just kind of made sense in my head and I kind of wanted it to look like a um, sort of more collage um, experience, I suppose. And in the middle with the large movable walls, it um, has images of the registro kind of opening up, um, really thinking about the function and replicating the idea of a book. A lot of books, I think, in, in the... Um, both the family albums and the registro. So in the sense that big movable wall, to me, I approached it like a giant book. Um, and we can kind of skip ahead. I, I am conscious of the time I'm taking up. Um, and yeah, so we obviously see these re religious symbols um, and kind of the ways that people have um, um, curated their own home, right? And these little images as well. So I really also liked having images of um, how people have crafted their own um, archives, I suppose. Yeah, uh, we can kind of skip ahead quite rapidly. <laughs> um, oh, like so images like this um, that, you know, have the portraits um, show how they're contextualized in people's homes and like their own communities and also, I guess, um, how they relate to the other images that are present in the exhibition. Now we can go to the next one. Excuse me, Dorcas, I wonder, is the person oh. in the bow tie, is that a man or a woman? I think that's a man, yes. Okay. Um, we, we can go to the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, next. Um, so also as part of the exhibition, I neglected to mention that there's also these audio interviews that I did with folks there, which was a really important component in my work in general. Um, I find that I, I've always said this, that I'm not like the best at photographing. I'm not, I'm certainly not the best at, you know, putting together images of any sort, um, but I am really good at asking questions. So and I am, I don't know what, I had someone remark upon this the other day, they were like, you're really good at asking questions and listening. Is it because of the work you do or is it innate? And it's kind of a chicken and egg situation. I've always been curious and I've always liked to know more about people. Um, so that just ended up being part of the work. Um, so you'll hear, once you go into the exhibition, you will hear um, these audio interviews, pre predominantly in Spanish, although I did do them I did do one in Cantonese when I was there. I'm not very good at Cantonese. Um, and uh, one, I think, in Mandarin as well. Um, and so we're um, at the registro slides. Um, so obviously the registro was really kind of formative in that it was the narrative of how I came across it was that the there's an uh, associ Chinese association in Punta Arenas, a bright, currently I think it's a yellow building, but um, they'd been given this, the, the register, the document um, that had been discarded. So, you know, it was a document that the state had enforced, but then discarded, right? You think about the erasure of these histories and somebody had salvaged it from the trash and given it back to the association. So when I heard that story, I, I, you know, like looking at the book, feeling the touch and like the haptics of holding it, it's really um kind of an emotional reaction like I, I I got like goosebumps I remember um so that's a really interesting document for me that I'm still trying to parse through um and we also think about the missing registros right these were across Costa Rica in various towns um but we only I've only seen one right um and we can kind of scroll through the rest of the um, images I am again conscious of time um but you see these sort of interspersed in them. We also see, you know, pasaporte. We see family photos in them. Um, so it's interesting to have this sort of relationship. And I guess the last slide I was kind of at um, is this idea of um, identification or misidentification that I have with this community because I am part of the Chinese diaspora. But again, this is not my community. 
Um, so I think re navigating that sort of interesting dynamic of, you know, I talk about not having that many photos of my grandparents or my family in photo albums. And therefore, I'm so kind of attracted to identifying with some of these images and seeing some kind of semblance of kinship in them. But it it is also probably somewhat misplaced um, as well. So kind of thinking about those things. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the gist of it um, at the moment. Um, and I'll pass it on to Aisha. Aisha, yeah. yeah but, uh, before, before <laughs> I just want to say that I think your photo photographs are beautiful. Uh, I, don't, I don't I don't think you should uh, poo poo it. I think they're, 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 they're just wonderfully, you know, aesthetically lovely photographs. As well, so. Thank you. Um, sure? Dorcas, I absolutely echo what Raphael said. Exhibition is beautiful. Your work is beautiful. And you know, this is so amazing. Like we are all, we had this conversation when we were talking about pre-panel that all of us being together on this panel who are peers, who are work together. And then this is like a, a quote from Baki Ratimani, who is a dear friend and a perfect segue for me to um, kind of talk about the connections you know we talk I, I think this exhibition is all about connections right this panel is all about connections what connections we make um i remember when rafael invited me for this panel and i saw your work first time there was like an instant con connection um in the u.s people from south asian countries such as pakistan bangladesh and india uh, call each other desis um, as a way to connect, uh, even though back in their own countries, they are not, uh, they can't connect with each other because of politics, right? So the term desi I find is to be very equivalent to uh, Pesino, Pes, uh, Pesano, uh, used by the Chinese of for each other in uh, Costa Rica. So I thought that was like really, really instant, something very diaspora, very uh, connecting each other. And uh, um, Raphael, if we can go to our first slide for Said's work. And again, um, I want to talk about his work a little bit because I really wanted um, Dorcas to make the connection here. Um, that was my, again, immediate, uh, I would, immediately I was reminded uh, me of Sayyid Hussein's work. Um, Sayyid, his uh, Hazara background, uh, people who live in Afghanistan and Koita in Pakistan. Um, and the thing about Sayyid's work is he draws attention to the limits of and capacities of photography. So I thought that was like a very common connection where he paints. Um, and the Hazara has been the burnt of violence based in race on multiple fronts. And due to their uh, their Asian features, uh, give them a distinct look. They become a very visible target of that crossfire and uh, uh, raciality, partly because of their um, faith of Shia Islam, a minority often attacked by um, Sunni militant groups. Um, so if you and um, Raphael, if you can slowly uh, please move the slide. So this one, you will see the passport and this one, um, Sayyid works consist of official photographs and family portraits of Hazara men, families and children, their official passport and national ID card photos. He paints them uh, with uh, with miniature technique, with one thing uh, like uh, on a Wesley handmade paper. Um, because of censors on reporting violence against them, Sayyid collects information on the community members and meticulously paints the passport page with the photo and kind of replicates them, their official presence that has been silenced. Um, so in that sense, I saw a clear uh, yes, we we can slowly. I saw a clear overlap of this work with Dorcas's reproduction of the registro, and you know, uh, it was mind blowing. So for me, it was like really amazing experience, kind of seeing those both of your work. Um, and Sayed also challenges the ways these painting painted photographs are seen. Um, by showing us how the government or the hegemonic power sees them and how we see them today. Um, so Raphael, if we can please um, go through. So this is his portrait series. This is from the Hazara children series. Um, some of these kids are missing. Um, and then uh, again, and some of them are part of um, just kind of uh, documenting them. And then um, there is another image, I think. Yes. So this is a series from where uh, family members are missing. So he find their old photographs and he kind of create that missing silhouette. And it hits you when you see them. They are not photographs. They are actually paintings. And I think there is one more. Yes. And this is their uh, passport um, stamps, their pass. And this is, again, this is not a photograph. This is a painting. Um, is this 
this is it, right, Raphael? Yes. Um, so that's what I, because I know this panel was all about connections and all about how we see Asian art. So I really thought, I really wanted to bring that to this panel today. Thank you. I think that um, this is kind of like one of the, one of the main concerns about is about visibility. That's one of when I, that's one of the first connections that, uh, that uh, when I, when Dorkin presented that work, talks, talks to me about visibility. And I feel like what Saeed's also working that connection is also about the idea about visibility. And, 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 and hearing Dorcas, we, when we, we, when, when we hear these oral stories interlocking is about how that visibility has been maintained through photographs and through some, through some sort of records. Um, and how I feel that some personal records are being maintained as well as, as well as some of the official records are being maintained. And then, and then, and then, and then that kind of a conversation. Um, I don't know, and yeah, I was I was one of the well, because one of the questions we did have was about how we been talking about representation in art, and and how and that's something that's very you know that's you know it's it's a delicate subject because it, because many I mean, because we come from institutions where where we're often. When that's when it, when the talk when we talk first about Tahir part of Kenya, we think about what's been seen, what also and what's and what's not been talked about, what's been sort of hidden or, or put to the back, and then we then we're all, and then we're trying to bring and then we're and, and when so we always try to bring things forward into the conversation, always recognizing that they've always been part of the conversation, they were just they were they were just never acknowledged, um, and then uh, so. But when we but when we bring but there's always a question when we bring in an artist's perspective or someone else's perspective. I mean, it does, you know. I think in Dorcas' conversation, she's talked about the imperial view, like imperialism, or talking about the views of power and how that affects the presentation, you know, of the, the view. I had some sort of ideas, like for me, thinking about Latin American. I was thinking like thinking about Robert Frank when I was talking about you, Darkus, like how these everyday photos, his American seers of photography for me were just very basic, prosaic. They're nothing incredibly special, but they're reviewing. But then he did a series of, of, of photographs about Peru. And then we think about South America, there's always about poverty. And, and he's a Swiss man living in the United States, having a, a particular view. And then Manuel Alvarez Bravo, another perspective. And then he started thinking about who is a Mexican photographer kind of perpetuating this kind of an idea of when maybe that's been carried out through film and through cinema. And these are often portrayals which were, you know, that are, you know, our institution was been at odds at, at and then through the civil rights movement and thinking about some sort of that, thinking about different perspectives. And there was, an, you know, there's another um, artist, Susan Maizales, you know, to, and then when thinking about this in the late 80s, 70s, thinking about South America, thinking about dictatorship and here she was, she was looking at, um, uh, um, Samosa in uh, Nicaragua, and thinking about um, this portrayal of violence of um, men, you know, men, men with and women with nothing on, which is weapons, and at all just killing each other. And these are and these are the depictions. Um, but there's all. But I felt like you know, I think I think I think there's a counter narrative. I don't know. But in all of these pictures right there, you know, there's really never, there's no other, they, they don't really talk about, there's other imagery about other complexities, but the other, other the other people living in societies and how these societies are trying to, trying to, our uh, conversations about trying to understand themselves. I mean, because I feel like when you think about the Americas, these are all countries born out of colonialism that are trying to form an identity. Guatemala, the indigenous people are still being, um, you're being still being sacrificed. You're still being murdered, you know. And and while they're while the while the while their European aristocracy are still trying to shape the narrative of what it, of the country. So yeah, um, so I'm, I'd like to talk about like that. So if you can just maybe we could just maybe talk about the idea of representation. How should we we be seeing? Representation now, how and how and what is the role of art in art institutions? If like if um 
this is much more complicated living here in the, United, in the Americas. I don't know if Anne, had, I, didn't, I mean, yeah. I know that Anne, when, I, when, I, when, yeah. when, when I look at the Asian Arts Initiative, I mean, he, the mission is very complicated thinking about the idea that there's no singular Asian. Asia, Asia is much more complicated than this. Well, I actually want to go back to just talking about the craft. Um, you know, as I look at these images that you all have presented, and um, it's so interesting to me, the history of photography is in itself sort of a colonial imperialist project because it begins with a desire for documentation. And at, I mean, I know in like the history of photography, there's this idea of like, it used to frighten people, right? Like photography was sort of suspicious and the people who were most excited about it were the ones developing the technology of it. And so um, something that the three of you have all said about the images of people, of groups of people and communities is there's, you know, Raphael used the word prosaic. There's something sort of just um, kind of mundane about pictures of people and then Dorcas, you talked about how the aspect of your photography we should think about isn't specifically its uh, aesthetic acumen, but more sort of how it leans into this greater project you have of documenting um, stories. And I mean, I think these images visually are really stunning, but, um, you know, and then Aisha, I'm thinking about with Hussein's, uh, you know, I, I keep thinking about the difference between documentation and art or the difference between history and art. And when documentation becomes art as a political act, right? Um, when it isn't supposed to serve its primary function anymore as a vehicle of surveillance or as a means of, you know, as a, as a tool of history or historicism. Um, and that kind of makes me think about the, the, that, you know, not to get philosophical, but the question we always ask ourselves is what is art? Because there's this sort of weird, the, the threshold I believe for um, especially people of color, but certainly those who are sort of, you know, live as forced migrants have to prove that what they're doing goes a step above just documentation, right? Like that the art is actually art. And so that leads me to this concept of, Raphael, you're kind of um, alluding to this idea of like, what is what is representational art or why does it matter and if it matters and the politics behind that. And um, I know in a different conversation I'd mentioned I, I'd invoked the the book Unnamed, The End of Asian American Art by Suzette Min, where she makes a compelling case about how representation should not be the goal of art by uh, folks in the subaltern or in the global south or in marginalized communities. That representation is just an aspect, but the goal of art for a group of people could be liberation or that the politic is not the representation, but the existence is, the existence is the political act, right? So not to confuse um, how, am I being, how am I being shown with what makes being a part of this so spectacular and amazing. So um, I, you know, I, I, I'm really enjoying this work and also just slightly switching gears, but Dorcas, what I really appreciated about your show was your including recorded oral history. I think that's just such a powerful, important tool that we hear from the voices while we have these opportunities. Um, and, you know, the precarity of sound is already just so interesting, but just because that also gives us this other color of sound and like the way voices are differentiated. Um, my mother, when she speaks English, you know, is a very different English than mine. Um, Aisha's English is very different than Raphael's English. So like hearing that is a really important aspect of also how we present ourselves. Um, so those are just some immediate thoughts and um, I, I welcome 
I, I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. Those are those are things on my mind as I see this work. And thank you so much. And of course, um, Dorcas, I would love to hear your perspective that. But you know, when we were talking about the other day that politics of race and representation in art, um, through, of course, from artist perspective, and of course, I want to hear Dorcas point here and then of, for art institutions. And, and you and I, of course, we're representing art institutions here. So here we have multiple things happening, right? And then what you talk about the documenting of work too. So I always think that they all come down to simple um, convergence and a question of representation. Um, there is the artist and then there's an art institutions. And art is, arts institutions can be museums, gallery, even art schools. So even if I begin with art schools, um, so I have like, this is again my experience, the traditional art schools canon has historically focused on Western European and American art history with a heavy emphasis on white male artists. So we hear, uh, we hear about a great push uh, to diversify the canon by including artists from different cultures, backgrounds and genders, but we don't see it getting implemented at any significant scale. And, um, and then from what I have seen art schools, even with the Global South still use old and tired canon of Western art as a standard. I know it will take some time and I know it will change. And of course, there is push coming, resistance coming. And of course, when there is a push towards change, it will happen. Um, but coming to institutions, museums are still very white male centric. Anytime an amazing non-white show is highlighted, it label it ethnic uh, makers like it is uh, Asian art, or it's an Arab art. So. So I know institutions like Asian Arts Initiative and 12 Gates, and, and please correct me if I am not uh, presenting it right. Like our, I think our mission, mainstream, our mission is to like mainstream the margins and present artists within just contemporary art. Yes, they are South Asians. I know they're Asians. They are from Swana regions, but they are making contemporary art. And they're using contemporary issues or new trends and they're documenting that way and they are not making asian art or arab art and they don't have those labels so and i am and i'm sure there's a much deeper historian discussion and i'm not art historian so i really wanted to talk to you and and to Raphael, to you and to dorcas to you to all three of you because this is kind of a peer panel for me do you feel the same way the way i feel and um I really wanted to talk about that too. And again, um, and coming directly from your point, how we document uh, art. Yeah. Well, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I was just going to just chime in and just basically say that. And in my point, I think maybe there's a shortcoming to the understanding of what art is or talk, how we talk it is, maybe that definition or whatever the terminology is the problem. Um, so I, and I feel that, uh, Fayer's institution is also bring, bringing this in. And I feel like what, for me, sometimes what things it's when, what I'm, what I, what register, what affects, when I, when I look at it, when I think about something that I like, it's what affects me. And, and going back to Dorcas Tang in his exhibition, what I mean, when I first saw that work, when I'm thinking about this is that, um, First, how I, it made me think about how I understand myself as being a Venezuelan because of the image that has been painted in my mind, um, seeing something different. Then how others might perceive that to be a Venezuelan. So if the, if it's, if it, if the, work, the work of art maybe registers something new or just, or just kind of creates some sort of dissonance, makes you think. And then it makes me thinking about what it is to be a citizen of a place, and then those and those are those are the things. And then then which um, Dorcas said something which is very profound um, in in her interview, which also kind of affected me because it also affected me when I was just listening, seeing seeing an Asian person speaking Spanish, how the, uh, uh, and and then how that was jarring, and it was about his perfect Spanish made me think because it also affected me in thinking about because 
being from Venezuela, when we're when it's great that we started as this. There, even though I might might present myself as looking Venezuelan, but as soon as I speak Spanish, they will know that I don't speak Spanish, Venezuelan, Venezuelan Spanish with an with a Venezuelan accent. So even though I might have a Venezuelan passport at that time, I am completely n not from that place. Immediately, so I'm completely an outsider, as as if I was an outsider here. So in which which kind of which is an which is an interesting place to be. So I think this is thinking about being in what is being an art. It isn't exactly about talking about truths. It isn't something about telling. It's always about telling a story, but maybe about trying to give some sort of an insights into it, and maybe and and then and then and then that insights hopefully kind of enriches. I feel that for me, seeing what's happening in the Latin American community, where the um, being trying to be bringing gender neutrality in, into the language, um, into into thinking about what it is to be maybe a citizenship right now, which I think something which I was made me think about when maybe with Dorcas's Tang maybe bring a greater awareness where there is not a there is not a record about other people. Those are really those are very those are for me very incredibly fascinating, and draw. And then, then, then thinking about what it is, you know, this is in regards to, you know, in South America, we're very present about colonialism, and like in Dor like Dorcas has said before, in in, in our entry, there we, we learn a lot about um, we learn about learn about all that colonization about the indigenous people, and then we started talking about the African American experience, but then we but we never think of, we never we, but the Asian experience in the Americas is, has has always been. Not talked about, so that also kind of complicates us. So all of those things are kind of coming together in this one experience, and I feel in that kind of comes into an institution like a year, which I think elevates this kind of a conversation because it's because it's a conversation that is happening. Similar conversations are happening in different societies all across the world. So, so I sort of say. thank you, Rafael. Uh, I want to say just something real quick to respond to Aisha's point about the sort of what motivates organizations like ours to do this work. And I think w one thing about art just, um, I, and I really want to talk about, I think what Rafael's talking about is like cultural and racial legibility, but, but, but just to the point about art and presentation, I think for folks like us, and I, I don't even want to define who that means, you know, just us. <laughs> Um, art, I think both has to be taken more seriously and less seriously. Like, I think anything can be art. And I also think art is pretty magical if you do, if you're doing it. And the only thing I can pinpoint about what, what it, what makes something important or what makes it good is when you look at the person making it and understand that they couldn't possibly not do it, right? There's a sort of inevitability about the work. And I think that's, I, I guess I, I, I sort of come prepared with these responses, in, mostly for my own debates, because art, art, art by our people is judged in a way that's so, so different than those people you just mentioned, Aisha, the like establishment, the status quo. And that's gonna, it's, I don't even know if I want that to change because I, you know, we're just coming up with different solutions and strategies for honoring our work. But when people see our work that are not from our community, they're they they're asking the wrong questions, right? Like they're sort of most of the time it's just the wrong question. So my my obligation is solely to my community, our community. And so to them, I just my job is just to keep saying, what you're doing is very important. Also, it's not that important. Like, cause I need you to be able to keep doing it. And if you thought it was the hardest thing on earth, you would not be able to face the day, right? Like, and I'm sure young artists, um, I haven't met a single young artist uh, who doesn't suffer from some kind of anxiety. So it's sort of just both saying everything is art, your existence is art, and then simultaneously, like make sure you're being taken seriously because you you will not be afforded the like benefit of metaphors and allegories and 
theories and academic speak, like everybody's going to look at you and say, oh, that's registering to me as Chinese art, Chinese American art, Latinx art, you know, uh, South Asian art. And we all know it's so much more than that. Um, that, that you know, and again, also not much more than that. Like it, may, it, might, it might just be like, it might, it might be that simple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I really, oh, sorry. Can I just jump in real quick? Please, I want to hear your perspective. Yes. Um, yeah, both of what you said really has stuck with me. But and yes, certainly I'm a young artist with a lot of anxiety, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think it's so true that, you know, as an artist, there's certainly I think it ties to the idea of representation, right? You're like, there's a lot of pressure from institutions or grant funding bodies to tick certain boxes to make visible these very specific parts of our identities. And yeah, we should certainly just be allowed to be artists rather than queer artists or artists of color, which spaces like 12 Gates and Asian Arts Initiative, like you said, Aisha, mainstreaming the margins, like where you're making these spaces so that we you know, are not needing to kind of pr prove something, I suppose, or have to kind of fight the man in this way, like represent in this predominantly white space is still, right? When we think of representation, we're thinking of media, we're thinking of institutions like museums, tertiary institutions. And you can't dismantle the master's house with the master's tools, something that stuck with me from um, school. And yeah, so I suppose this is something that I'm personally still working through as well, because at the same time, my identity is so kind of inextricable from the work I'm doing. So, Yes, I am working with these themes and these topics, and I am a Chinese, like a diaspora artist or whatever. But um, yeah, it would just be nice to have the freedom to have fun and not feel the weight of political representation <laughs> in my work. And yeah, I think one thing that has come up very recently is somebody messaged me on Instagram saying, oh, like, one of the people you documented in the project is a estranged uncle of mine can we talk about it? So I think in that sense for the, like the idea of making work for the, my community is like, it comes out in these little small, I suppose, more simple gestures, right? That is where I feel the most profound impact in making um, my work. Mm. That's incredible. Wow. Um, yeah. I, you know, another aspect of how you know, representation art, I'm just thinking of now this idea of like how we present race. It's, it's so, it's hard because I guess I want to acknowledge that this country has done an incredible job of training us to market everything about ourselves, right? Like our identities can kind of be kind of packaged in ways and, and, um, I guess there are certainly other cultures where that's really present, but I I feel like having seen a lot of things in a lot of places, Americans really know how to sell things. Like that's what we're really good at. And so we that's fall into this one. trap. Of, yeah, just we do fall into this trap of kind of even breaking ourselves up into these boxes to tick off, like you said, Dorcas. So it's... um. I'm hemming and hawing because I guess what I'm trying to say is I don't want to discount that either. Like if that's the language we grew up in, we, we might as well learn how to use it and just, you know, pervert it even. Um, and I think actually that's something I really respect about Tayer is actually as a museum and as a community based organization, you know, if, and when I have assumptions about what I think, Latina culture is supposed to look like, I mean, it breaks it apart, right? So it's not just mainstreaming the margins, but also like exposing, just sort of celebrating the margins. Like, you know, you thought things were X, Y, and Z. I mean, yeah, there is something shocking about hearing an Asian presenting person speaking predominantly in a, in a Spanish language or a Spanish timbre. 
Um, yeah. Um, I wanted to add something and then I know we have only two minutes left and we're going for Q&A. Um, and so, um, Dorcas, the you just said that um, like having that freedom, right, of making art and, and of course my conversations with a lot of artists um, and I truly believe in this, that artist's job is their creators, right? They are negotiating already so much for coming to the terms of showing their work and that isn't easy. And I, I always think that's a curators, like then curators come in, right? And then the institutions come in. And I believe like in Raphael, this question is actually, I would like to ask you something because you're curator of this exhibition. And I feel like artist is doing their work. And as Anne said, important, you have to do it, but you can't do it if you if, if it's not making you, right? If it's not making you happy or it's giving you too much pressure. And, but then curators come in and that curator's job is to bridge those connections and then institution job is to highlight those connections, right? And make sure uh, the job is done, right? So Raphael, to be honest, I really wanted to ask you this question here, like you as a curator, um, what kind of responsibility you feel and it all comes natural or you think about it a lot, um, and especially at Tale, and then if you are curating a show for another place? Um, well, for me, I think this exhibition came natural to me. Because like I said before, thinking even just basing off my own personal experiences, because it made that connection. Um, but also, but I wanted, but um, but I do want to address something with that and Annie. She, she, I, I, I love what she, I love what you were saying both about we should kind of like, um, like about trying to like uh, lean into something as well as not to overvalue it. But also wondering about talking about thinking about their conversation art. Like, how can you ever, when being in an institution like Tayyar, and thinking about how can you not be yourself if if let's say like a Venezuelan person builds, makes a chair, is that chair a Venezuelan chair? Uh, does it, you know, it's, or does it have, or, or, is, or does it have to meet a expect, some expectation? And I definitely do think that artists in a sense, since they get kind of get typecast into, into a genre that I mean, you know, made me thinking about like, when you think about design, the Santa Fe school, you know, there's like, you have to, you know, people living in the, in the Southwest, you know, who are commissioned, you know, who might be indigenous people that, have, you know, have to, you know, do the bead work that have to look traditional in order to meet, you know, this, this assumption, you know, this look. And then, and then, and then the thing about marketing of, of culture, which is, you know, neo, neoliberalism thinking about, you know, and there's something happens here in North Philadelphia. And I think art in a sense, some artists, for me, in my mind, thinking about it, the idea of like um, branding uh, El Centro de Oro, which I think, which is inspired with with um, the Chinatown and the little Tokyos, the Americas, in order to conceptualize. But there is no idea. And then the idea of like, of this, of um, this artificiality of bringing people together. I mean, as a curator, I'm having this conversation a lot of Latina dad, which is a lot... When we talk about South Latinos and Hispanics is only an American invention, came out of the politics of the 1970s in order to in, in order to in order to bring up and in order to bring um, more awareness and in and, and, and political capital and use capital polit create political capital in the society. And that kind of stayed, but it also became kind of a straitjacket because it also kind of flattens our perceptions. And um so so uh, I think as a curator, thinking about the contemporary art, I mean, we're working, thinking about the Western canon. Um, so, I mean, I feel like everything, all artists, you know, all working with contemporary mediums. I just saw your show at um, uh, at 12 Gates, you know, used with holograms, um, Arab futurism, you know, um, and, and thinking about, which is, I feel is in conversation with the other, with Afrofuturism, and the idea of perceptions, and then the and, and, and but it's also using technology. It's also using it's also using very um, plastic means, which is of today, to talk about 
talking about their geopolitics, I think, and what's happening in the world, and also thinking, which is also kind of approaching these conversations about like, you know, what's the kind of future that we want to you want to paint? As I was asking the question, I mean, so I mean, yeah, I I I think this is really very natural. I mean, I feel like you know, Tayer, you know, it's it's self defeating. I mean, I feel like you know, there there's there's actually utopian aspects, you know, because, you know, you know, I would love that, that I we didn't have to think of these conversations today. I do not know, understand what exactly what is Puerto Rican art or Mexican art exactly. And especially when so many artists are looking at each other and traveling back and forth and those conversations have always been happening. The only pure art that I really quite understand is thinking about indigenous. And there's some artists like me, like I'm thinking about, you know, Kukuli Velarde, we're thinking about maybe that you know there's a Western perceptions of art, but there there's there there there's these indigenous aesthetics which are never really completely appreciated or explored, and maybe trying to, and what about trying to understand it at their own at their own level and how and how much of a stretch of our imagination that would take to look at it at their own level. So you know that's a lot to say. I'm sorry. Hopefully that's uh, hopefully I answered your question in some weird way. Thank you so much. What about you? What? How do you approach it? How do you? How do you yeah, I'm, I, mean, I know that you talked a little bit about that, but but how? What do you think about the contemporary art and this idea? This conversation about what is it? What is a South Asian art? And and I feel like when I'm looking at darkest is saying, I feel that these questions about being born of a place, which is, which is one of the questions we have on our wall, the place of origin, and how, and how does place of origin make you represent, you know, that nationality? So since we're all kind of become a little bit transnational. Sure. Rafael, did you ask this question to me or Anne? Because I heard Anne. Um, I, I, I mean, sorry, Aisha, uh, to you. Yes. Okay, because I, I, I was like, okay, let me just go. So, um, so Rafael, for me, it's been 14 years, right? For 12 kids. Um, and uh, for us, um, setting up, again, what we want to show and how we show, right? Um, we don't want to think about it too much because organization purpose is to support emerging young contemporary artists. And they are the the artists who are showing their work the, the art work we are presenting that is by south asian artists and that's the only um i guess that's the south asian as there and then but again over and over over and over at 12 gates we make that point it is a contemporary art so you know what my dream is? Like I go to these institutions, I go to these museums and I stumble upon artworks, contemporary artwork done by South Asian artists, by Asian artists, artists from Sawana region and without any um, label next to them. Mm. They're just part of exhibition among all other contemporary artists. So I think that's what 12 Gates is trying to do over and over. So I'm not a curator, so I will never like I won't take that um, kind of uh, I won't take that credit. So we make sure we work with curators who understand, uh, who are part of, uh, who are emerging, who are young, and who are rep who are presenting contemporary art. We work with them over and over again, and we can make the connections with artists and with them over and over. So then there's a dialogue, then there is a relationship, there's a connection, and then one exhibition happens. So your question was, how do you, I, tell me again, it's like, how do we do it or how do you see it? I think is how do you see it? I mean, how do you, yeah, how do you see, see the role of origin playing, I mean, or the, or the place of birth playing in, in your context? So, so because for the origin of birth and for place, um, 
I'm only representing myself. I'm South Asian. I'm an immigrant. I can't take anyone else's responsibility. So I think what I am seeing, I will just say that my perspective coming from 12 Gates will be important that if representation and politics of race is never overlooked, you know, when making decisions about any show, about any exhibition, and empowering the storytellers to share their own narratives. And that storyteller can be artist, and that storyteller can be curator. So I think providing that space, that safe space, and that independent and freedom space, I think that's where as my my role comes in. But at institution role, of course, my job is to facilitate that role. But I cannot take that claim that 12 Gates is representing anyone. Yes, we're presenting. I can only talk about my representation. So did I answer the question? Yes, yes, you did. And I think maybe we should maybe move on to some of the questions we, um, it's getting a little late from, from that were submitted. Um, we have one question and um, I'm not sure, and I'm thinking maybe that maybe Dorcas can answer, maybe for her, um, but, I, but I think maybe if anyone else wants to answer it as well, please do. Um, the question is what cultural adjustments were necessary were necessary when you visited Chinese communities outside of Costa Rica, example, in the USA or China? Um, yeah, sorry to, um, I don't, uh, I was just wondering, Anne, were you about to say something earlier? Did you oh, want to? Oh, it's, it's totally cool. Um, oh. I'm not sure what I was trying to say. <laughs> if, it, <laughs> if it comes back, I'll interrupt you, sorry. <laughs> please do, please interrupt me. Um, I guess to answer that question, um, I think that, um, I, I don't think it's like a conscious necessarily like, um, because the only work in terms of making a project that I've done with regards to the Chinese diaspora has been in Costa Rica thus far, specific to the Chinese diaspora. I've worked, um, in other, in obviously so-called Australia, um, and I, I guess in my personal experience, my codes, it's more to do with code switching, maybe in certain cities in China where I grew up, like Shanghai, um, I'll try and speak in a Mandarin that sounds more neutral rather than, you know, my deeply Southern Chinese accent. And then in Costa Rica, I speak Spanish. So I, I don't know if it was and, and because the, you know, large percentage of um uh, the Chinese population in Costa Rica was also Southern Chinese. There was no need for me to necessarily um, actively put in any sort of code switching because, um, yeah, like like I mentioned in one of my story stories that I mentioned is that when I first got to Arenas, one of the first dishes that Flora, the older woman who I was staying with, um, cooked was um, pata de chancho, which is um, pork trotters in vinegar. And that was something I grew up eating. Um, so it wasn't necessarily an active, oh, I have to code switch here and change my behavior to maybe a sim fit in in some capacity. Um, yeah. And then Chinese-ness in America, I think, is a whole nother thing um, that is, you know, I don't know. I speak, I, I think it has to, uh, I, in, in answering this question, I suppose what comes up is like my language abilities and the accents that I can code switch in and out of. In Malaysia, I try to speak with a Malaysian accent. I don't know. It doesn't, it's not great, but yeah, that's me. That's how I, I think about this question. Mm. Mm. Does anyone hear a code switch? I feel they feel they have to do some code switching, but I did feel that that was a question about code switching from one place to the other. Do I code switch? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do I like it? No. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I try to, but I feel at it. I mean, I feel like I don't have a New York City accent. Like, <laughs> I don't know if I sound, sound like I say coffee, but anyway. Mm. And I feel like if I did, it makes me feel more at home, but who knows. But it does talk about the idea, but uh, but it, is, uh, it does bring to attention the idea of like peer pressure, some sort of like mm. said, that you have to sort of adapt it by uh, putting wearing these masks. Well, and I guess I, it, uh, yeah, to me, it makes me think of where are you read as a local? Mm -hmm. That is maybe more, where are you read as like belonging there? Mm -hmm. um, which I am never, I like literally any, like 
not in Malaysia, not in China, not in the US, not in so-called Australia. None of these places am I read as a local. Um, yeah, but, but you know, that's just how my experience has been. I will say this, I mean, about code switching also, there's like, um, I, I think and I can't avoid feeling an, a sense of needing to pay respect, right? So like, if I'm in Asia, I'm going to behave a very different way. And some of that is just deference to the culture. And I'm going to just, it won't feel as bad because it's, it feels like the right thing to do and there are aspects of that where i come home sort of especially if i'm in like a really patriarchal setting in like japan that feels the that feels kind of funny later but i also just think some of that is um like when it when is that um when is that deferential and when is that code switching you know um i think about that sometimes you know about code switching i feel like it's not that i'm not capable of i don't know how to code yeah. switch <laughs> <laughs> so, it's true you don't <laughs> <laughs> i've seen you in places where you're just yeah i'm sorry i'm, not, I'm just kind of making fun of aisha as a personal friend just um of course <laughs> <laughs> no, and I was like, "Oh my You're god!" Not crying, Aisha. <laughs> Again, I'm boring with brown, boring hair. See, I can't even code switch. So for me, the biggest thing is I, whenever I travel, uh, especially to South Asia, um, I know the language. I'm speaking the language. I'm fluent at it. I am doing everything. Where do you live? I live here. No, 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 no. Right. Where do you live? And when I'm here, of course, uh, there is, I'm not trying to hide anything. So I think the only part of court switching that's, where are you from? I'm from Philadelphia. No, no, no I'm not asking for Philadelphia. I'm asking where you origin. I'm from Philadelphia. You know, and now I kind of annoy that because it's just like, I'm not interested telling you my history. It's just like a small interaction we're having, right? So I guess I sh must say, I can't, I don't know how to do court switching. <laughs> <laughs> so, but hopefully one day I might learn. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this really, really brings, calls up a lot of attention. The idea is, you know, there, you, for me, one of the questions we had was, well, I had was, I was thinking about the idea of like, what is the, the, the visual paired with the audio recording? Because it's, you know, the code switching is actually, it's an auditory. It's, how, mm -hmm. it's the way we use language, but it's also, I guess, physical, the way we kind of present ourselves, you know, you know, there's some small gestures. But I think the first thing is the language, and 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 that's a, and and um and I wonder, you know, I was gonna when so like when Dorcas, I mean, I feel like having, you know, like I said, we you know we're playing the audio in the gallery, and then we and, we, and then as well as looking at the imagery in order to just trying to fill up the space, with, so we can hear them, and isn't you just don't hear it with the, you know, the headphones, and which is what which was. Something you know we were trying. I think you might have presented it differently. When how how, how did you? What is what is that? Um, how you know how does that kind of play out in an idea of the th thinking about like with codes when we do code switching? There is an objective. I mean, it's to the idea of trying to fit in that objective, like you know. And then, what were you thinking about that? You know, because you were you know that's a. That's very intentional. Um, do you mean like the recordings the audience and, and yeah. the pictures? Because I mean, they're next to each other. They, they're, they're. I feel they're. It isn't just the image itself. It's the yeah. image plus the audio. And the yeah, audio is always another. That kind of is less about code switching necessarily, and more of as we spoke earlier about the camera's function as a sort of like colonial tool, imperial tool, I think in having the audio there and having my own vo literal voice like in it, yeah. it kind of um, negates the neutrality, I hope, of the work. Because I, every, you know, the idea of a documentary um, function as being neutral, which is quite violent in that con concept, the idea of neutrality, I think, subjectiveness. So the function of having it there is also to hear my sort of 
you know, ums and ahs and imperfections through the audio um, to emphasize that my own opinions and thoughts really shape, very much shape what the viewer or visitor ends up seeing that, um, you know, it's a one to two minute segment of very hours long, multiple conversations that's been a deeply condensed snippet frozen in time, right? These are from, I think about often how mortifying it is to have something recorded from four years ago. And <laughs> it's, it's like forever, the same audio it's kind of crazy but I you know that's it feels quite permanent but my intention was always to go back and revisit these conversations as well so I don't know if this is necessarily code switching which is kind of my approach and my ethos and why I like having um, audio recordings um, in my work hmm. there's a uh, show I want to mention that is making me think of this or that this conversation is making me think of it I don't know if it's still up um Quilatana, Quilanaman, uh, it's spelled, you know what, I'm going to Google the name spelling because it's N-K-W-I-L-U-N-T-A-M-E-N, Quilanaman, and it's, um, it's an exhibition, it's a piece, it's, gosh, what do you call it? It's an installation by the artist Nathan Young, uh, and the Lenape artist who's based in Oklahoma now, and it's at Pensbury Manor in North Philly, just outside of the, I, might, I don't know if it's technically Philly, it's just on the edge of North Philly, but Pensbury Manor is like a historical recreation residence of William Penn's Manor. Um, and so it's a really strange place. Ob obviously, he chose it on purpose to stage uh, indigenous intervention. And the the piece, the, the installation is um, sound art and language art, um, very deliberately designed in this way where you have to, um, so you have like a digital component and you're listening you have to put in headphones and participate by listening and then they also have um furniture where you sit and listen to to music um and bringing this up because the the sort of goal of the show one of them they, and they say it explicitly in the beginning is to treat indigenous art as living and contemporaneous Whereas the way that most of the time the art gets presented, it's as if the indigenous people have already expired or gone extinct. Like the way that it is treated is always way back when this is how they used to do it. And the indigenous folks invented spiritualism and, you know, Turtle Island. It's always historical artifacts and not who's currently living and practicing art today. And I thought it was a really interesting decision that they decided to show, they started the audio component. There's a lot of rich audio in this installation, but it begins with a disclaimer um, being recited by a computerized voice. So it's, a, it's like a, this very computerized voice that just kind of reads you the right act. You're about to enter an indigenous artist's you know, exhibition. Um, and the craziest thing is that while you're experiencing this really amazing experimental uh, sound art, um, Pensbury Manor as a tourist destination has, <laughs> I guess they're actors or members of uh, ethnic communities from indigenous tribes coming to do talks about exactly the problem they're talking about, which is these like history talent shows uh, for predominantly, um, you know, educational purposes. So it's so interesting, like the, the decisions on how to present our voices, our little voices is also, you know, really, it's, it's really precarious. I mean, I, I love this conversation because we're really getting into these details about like, how do we code our voices? But um it does it means something right like you can tell as soon as somebody starts talking if this is like if we're talking 
conversationally, it's not even code switching. It's like, I'm talking to you all in a way that's going to be different than the way I talk to my family. And, and yet it's, it's going to be English both, both times. Um, anyway, it's a great show. If it's up, you should check it out. Thank you. Maybe it's, yeah, share that. I do want to, um, there's a comment on the chat and then maybe we should start like maybe thinking about wrapping this up. I really, in, I'm enjoying this. Just going to read it. Um, this is from Erica. She, she, she says that code switching often serves the purpose of protection, safety, or perhaps to create a sense of belonging. How do each of you cultivate authentic belonging? Mm. That's a question. Um, I guess to answer that question, I guess it posits code switching as contrasting to authentic belonging, if I understood that correctly. Or maybe that's just my interpretation of it. But for me, code switching, I guess, is authentic um, to my, at least to my experience, right? I'm not, it is intentional, but it is still, to me, authentic, right? Mm. I'm not, yeah, that's just how maybe, I feel. Maybe, might be, maybe instead of, of code switching, we're trying to cultivate something that's more real. If code switching is the mask that we wear, then maybe... That must be real, but no, I feel I'm, like there might be, yeah. Maybe for me, be. I guess for me, code switching is, me. Yeah. 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 And I think um, that's from your artistic perspective, right? For what I am reading it, like code switching where, uh, how do you cultivate that belonging? For me, I'm thinking, of, of course, I'm always thinking from organization perspective, like where people feel generally included and can be themselves without feeling need to code switch. Mm -hmm. And it's about fostering, I guess, authenticity and accepting behavior. That's how I see it. Like maybe that's what they're trying to ask us from that institutional perspective. So um, I don't, I might need help here too, but let me think. I, um, I think the thing that's interesting here is the dichotomy between safety and protection and authenticity. So I'm hearing, how do you cultivate a braver sense of belonging maybe or a more courageous sense of self because I certainly most of the time I am trying to stay safe these days right um, keep your head down don't say too much but where I think another question is where do I feel allowed to be you know brash and a little shitty and you know um authentic meaning sort of closer to my id <laughs> like where uh -huh. do I get to kind of you know show a little extra skin that kind of, for me that's what authenticity might mean is uh yeah places where I'm allowed to be take take bigger risks um mm -hmm. you know but do we have that not these days or we're liking it it's ai tire puerto rican i think those are really brave spaces everybody i mean i encourage y'all to show up naked literally or figuratively you know <laughs> so that's what i wanted to say like i think um that's what we're trying at institution level we're sitting here again as we said this is the conversation the coalition building mm -hmm. i think through these coalition buildings through these cohorts and this is for belonging for us as well, but also for anybody who wants to walk into those places, we can guarantee they are safe places and they can be themselves. And they, but of course, respect goes both ways, right? To maintain the integrity of right. the work we do and maintain the integrity of the space. So right. I guess. Something our colleague Aviva at the village said that I really liked is you might not be able to guarantee safety, but you can guarantee care. We care, right? And like us being sort of beholden to each other right now is, is a demonstration of care. Yeah, exactly. I feel very un- And it happens. That's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm sure it happens at Tele, it happens at AI, and it happens at 12 Gates when sometimes somebody walks in and they're like, okay, um, I needed my community and I walk in and I feel like somebody's holding me here. So mm -hmm. for me, for me, that is belonging. For me, that is, okay, I have cultivated that authenticity. Mm -hmm. They're like, where they feel that. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Can I just quickly add that? Oh, sorry, I know we're concluding, but when I was a sophomore at Swarthmore College, I interned at AAI. <laughs> it was, yeah, very formative experience and certainly speaks to the idea of, you know, safety and feeling the care and Wait, the when space. was this? I think it was before you were okay. director. Yeah, it was like probably 2016, 2017. Oh, yeah, that's a few years, that's a few years before I showed up. Wow, how cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> we're going to take credit for your success then so. yes please <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're good at that yeah, there's a long line <laughs> awesome well I really want to say I want to, I want to thank everyone here on EC Dorcas Tang and Aisha Kam you know for joining us in this conversation talking about um, the artwork of Dorcas Tang and, and, and talking about the idea about institutions and representation and um, you know, being really very considerate. And I just wanted to say that this exhibition, Workers of Tang's exhibition is up till, till, till March 9th, and we're gonna be closing it up with something but with, with, a, with a community event, which is gonna be based around food, which is called Rice is Everything. Uh, let me see if I could was gonna sh share that. What a great title. Yeah, yeah, and we wanted to, So you know, let's go back to them. Rice is everything, and it's going to be on March 9th from 1 p.m. Uh, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, the event is free. There will be food and refreshments. Um, Aisha, I'm trying to. I'm, I, I wrote to Shanzi, and I just haven't heard back. Maybe you can help me. I'm trying to be the, and, I'm, and I'm, we're we're looking for more chefs, and we're going to be a Puerto Rican chef as well. That we're bringing food, and we're going to have a conversation about rice. When we think about rice, we you know, in South America is one of the staple food. In South America, but it came in from Asia, and I feel having bring trying to bring I wonder, like we would like to bring a diverse community here um, to see the exhibition, um, to join in the food, talk about family history, uh, so talking about food and 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 personal histories about migration. Um, this is going to be family friendly, um, so please come. Uh, Dorcas Tang will be here. For this, we're really, really very excited. So finally, she will be here in the flesh, and we'll, and we're and we will have some other future surprises. So, if you can just go to our website, you can RSVP there, and we'll keep you updated. Also, yeah. want to just want to thank uh, our our sponsor, you know, our major supporter, PNC Arts Alive, who's really been making helping us make this um, make this all possible with their generous funding of the exhibition. And I want to just and also I know just again I want to, I want to thank Anna, she the partners of, of Asian Arts Initiative and and Twelve Gates for partnering the, just for this talk and for all the support. Um, this, um, if you have any questions, this video will be will be archived on on YouTube Live and and we'll be making a link on to at, uh, at the exhibition page at the airport at Kenya, so you can come back and revisit the conversation. And and I wish that everyone just could just please visit each other's institutions. Um, there, there's some, there, you know, Asian arts and 12 gates have some, some incredible shows and um, just join us. And I think you should, and I feel that there's just something, you know, very special that uh, that Philadelphia has to offer just by having these institutions here. And we appreciate the diversity and the incredible artists that are, that are being shown there. So thank you. Thank you, Raphael. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And that's the exhibition again. We're celebrating 50 years. Bye everyone. Have a fantastic okay. day. Bye. Bye.